Hi folks, Dr. Tom Mead. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Mead Show. My special guest, Dr. Steve Sinatra. He's been with us before. He's one of our most popular guests, one of the most sought after cardiologists in the country. He's an integrative cardiologist. What does that mean? He integrates 40 years of traditional cardiology, complementary alternative medicine. He's, he's, a, he's a thought provoker. He speaks well from the stadium and uh, any place that he is uh, at. He's published enormously, prolific writer. The book we're gonna talk about today is The Great Cholesterol Myth. And I had an introduction, but I, I told Dr. Sinatra, um, you know, for years I've seen this problem in my, in my office. Anecdotally, this week I saw a patient, 62-year-old female came in, had neuropathy in both legs, no, his, no history of heart disease, muscle aches, knee pain, and the first question I ask when it's not related to her knees, x-rays weren't too bad, but she comes in because my knees hurt, it's really her legs. I said, what medicines are you on? Are you on cholesterol? She goes, oh yes. And I said, well, which one? She goes, oh, every one of them. My doctor's been changing them and I just can't get a good one. I go, well, why are you on that? And she said, well, because my doctor told me. And I said, well, did she tell you that it increases neuropathy 16 times? that it increases your chance of diabetes, that it increases your chance of memory loss. And we're not making this up. These were warnings that came out last year by the, by the FDA. And I think I call it truth in medicine. If this was told, um, I'm not sure that the patient would be on it. And uh, I said, what if I told you as a woman at 62 with no history of heart disease, you're not gonna live longer or better? She goes, you're kidding. I said, that's the data out there. But they're afraid to stop it. And uh, they're not even on CoQ10, which statins decrease. But anyway, there was a greater force out there this morning. When I came here, I got this email. This came out four days ago, and I got the email from Europe today, but I had to read this because it's awesome. Oh, let me tell you something else. Is this controversial? I personally invited a bunch of cardiologists here today. Not one of them showed up. They all sent me relatively abrupt responses that said, I would be insulted to come and hear this lecture today. And I said, therein lies the problem. And um, let me tell you, I wrote, I wrote a uh, editorial in the morning call years ago on statins and everybody told me I was crazy. And I basically said that most people probably don't need to be on. There's a small percent of people that should be on them and we could talk about that because there is a value to statins. They're an anti-inflammatory. I didn't get one negative response from a family doctor. The head of cardiothoracic surgery at Lehigh Valley <clears throat> called me personally and told me it was the best editorial he's ever read. Cardiothoracic surgeon operates on hearts all the time, said it should be in the Wall Street Journal and every medical student should read this. There's someone in the audience, Jim Morrison, Jim Morris, who I talked to today, who after that editorial stopped taking uh, statins and he felt much better for his health. But anyway, so to, just to show you we're not crazy, this came out of Europe today. Leading doctors reject statin guidance from the National Institute for Health and Care. This is in Nice. And look at the Royal College of Physicians, general practitioners, epidemiologists, um, and even uh, from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Professor David Newman. They have problems with these new guidelines. They said, we're not comfortable following them for six reasons. The medicalization of millions of healthy individuals, there's conflicting levels of adverse advice, they hide the data, the industry has bias, there's loss of professional confidence, and there's conflicts of interest. The benefits of statins in a low risk population do not justify putting millions of extra people on a drug which has to be taken lifelong. Their serious concerns is that the data driving the latest guidance comes almost entirely from the pharmaceutical sponsored studies. Extensive research reveals that industry-sponsored studies systemically produce more favorable outcomes than non-industry-sponsored ones. No kidding. Industry trials grossly underestimate the adverse effects. We see it in 20 to 30 percent of people. And they do that by removing patients who fail to tolerate the drug in the selection process. It's the most profitable drug in the history of medicine. And they state relying on these studies alone will not represent those patients taking the drug in the real world and important findings from non-industry sponsored studies include a 48 percent increased risk of developing diabetes in women taking this drug. At the end of the day, cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Is that an epiphany? Hypercholesterolemia is not a disease. Cholesterol 
is in every cell of the body. It's an essential molecule. It's been there since the beginning of organisms five billion years ago. Single cell organisms produced cholesterol. To think if we give a drug that stops the production of that, and all the drugs are the same, HMG, CoA, reductase inhibitors, a little bit of biochemistry there, but you stop that, it's like poisoning the root of a tree to kill a leaf at the top. It'll kill that leaf, but what about all the fruits and the flowers? And that's basically an analogy. So, you know, with that, that's sort of my uh, hyped up review of, of what I see from uh, cholesterol. But why did you write the cholesterol myth, Steve? Well, you said it. I mean, all those points, we, that's why we wrote the book. I mean, that's oh, why we wrote What was amazing. I thinking? <laughs> you know, that's, that's all in the book. But, um, uh, you know, in all sincerity, Tom, uh, I used to be the choir boy for cholesterol. Uh, I used to lecture for drug companies, for Merck and Pfizer when I was chief of cardiology at my institution. Uh, as a young cardiologist, I believed in the cholesterol theory of heart disease. Um, we, I practiced in the Hartford area in Connecticut and uh, was following the Framingham data for, for years. And uh, I did a lot of cardiac catheterizations. I did about 3,000 of them in my, in my training and when I was a cath cardiologist for 10 years. And it really bothered me because um, I would do a, an angiogram on somebody with a cholesterol of 150 and uh, they would be riddled with, ca with cardiac disease. And, Sometimes I would do angiograms on people with cholesterol are 320, 350. I expect to find like, like rosary beads or just people riddled with heart disease, and they were normal. And uh, I, I used to scratch my head and I said, how can this be? Because the medical establishment is teaching us that this is a serious risk factor. And then over the years, um, when I started to use statins, when I used to lecture for the drug companies, I came across an article in 1992 and it was like, you know, you asked me the question, well, what happened? Well, it was like a, an epiphany went off. I was, I was chief of cardiology at the time. I read this article, it, I think it came out of India. It was about how statin drugs uh, impaired the production of coenzyme Q10 in the body. And I was using coenzyme Q10 a year ago, uh, 10 years ago, a decade before that. And I realized how vital coenzyme Q10 is for the heart. And I asked myself the question, well, wait a minute, how can something that's so vital for the heart be taken away by a drug that's supposed to be good for the heart. So I started to question it and immediately I stopped lecturing for the drug companies. Steve, that's, that's an amazing, that's an amazing that's statement. Story. It's an amazing statement. If you look at CoQ, so if I get what you're saying, if CoQ10 is important for the energy of a muscle and the heart pumps all day long, are we giving a drug that actually could make the heart weaker? So oh, if somebody absolutely. is in heart failure and you're giving them statins because they think their heart is getting better, it is, as an orthopedic surgeon, I would think that's not the case. Um, I want to get the cardiologist view on that and we'll get his opinion on can statins make your heart muscle weaker? We'll see that, we'll answer that right after the break. <music> Folks, we're back. Back with Dr. Steve Sinatra, number one integrative cardiologist in the country, and he's answering questions on statins and his book, The Great Cholesterol Myth. We're talking about CoQ10 and its depletion with statins. Can statin drugs deplete CoQ10 and actually make the heart weaker in a patient with congestive heart failure? And if you need statins, which some people do, and we could address that, can CoQ10 supplements reverse that? Sure, all, go all good points, Tom, all good points. Let, let me address this. Uh, first of all, um, there's an entity that we call statin cardiomyopathy. Uh, and what's happened over the last couple of decades is that we've seen an increase in heart failure in the country and a decrease in coronary disease. And it fits with statin therapy. Because there's no question, statins do some good things, but they do some very, very bad things. And one of the things they do do is weaken the heart muscle because, remember, when you kill cholesterol in the process, uh, that cholesterol pathway involves a pathway of squalene, which is good for the immune system, like squalene is found in olive oil, and, 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 and we need that to prevent breast cancer in women, for example. Um, uh, the CoQ10 pathway involves a cholesterol pathway, so when we kill that pathway, we knock out the endogenous production of CoQ10. 
So it's no wonder that you know, women who are on long-term statin therapy, 10 years or more, get more breast cancer. I mean, that's, that's, that's been proven in the literature. I mean, the diabetes situation uh, is alarming. You mentioned it's like 48% in, in postmenopausal women. But now we're seeing more heart failure because of diminished CoQ10. Now, statins have a bright side and a dark side. The dark side, no question. But when I use a statin, I mean, I'm a heart specialist, and I would use a statin. And I would use a statin in any male with coronary disease as long as he's actually below 75. And I'll tell you why. Statins are potent drugs. They happen to be potent antioxidants. They have an effect on adhesion molecules, which means that they thin the blood. And for me as a cardiologist, because of my experience with earthing, thinning the blood is huge. In fact, one of the best studies done on statins was the West of Scotland study. Where they took these Scots and they drank a lot and they smoked a lot. And um, uh, they, had, they happened to have some high cholesterols as well. But at the end of the day, when they did this study, they realized that, and even the researchers, when they reported this decades ago, they said statins, the way they were working was that they were doing something other than cholesterol lowering to make a difference. And they used the term blood viscosity. In other words, they were thinning the blood. And if you take a smoking male, smoking young male with a low HDL, you're in double handcuffs to develop coronary disease. And statins would help that male. So here's the deal, here's the bottom line. I know we have a short show here, so I want to get to the bottom line here. The bottom line is this. In any male with proven coronary disease, if he's less than 75, I'll give a low dose statin and I'll chase it with at least 100 to 200 milligrams of CoQ10. Because statins do some good things. Now, if that male develops you know, polyneuropathy, erectile dysfunction, if they develop liver problems, or if they develop uh, uh, memory problems, I'm gonna have to adjust. And if the side effects are worse than what I think I'm gonna gain, we'll take them off a of statin and, and use other lifestyle measures to thin the blood. Now, would I use a statin in a woman? Very rarely. Very rarely. I mentioned that in the Dr. Oz show uh, when the book came out a couple of years ago. Less than 1% of women in my practice were on statins. I would only use it in women who would, with far advanced coronary disease if I couldn't stop the progression with other natural methods. Well, they use statins in children. Again, very, very rare. I mean, there is an entity called familial hypercholesterolemia where you dealt some bad genes, but again, uh, I would not use it in these children unless they got two bad genes, and they had cholesterols of over a thousand, and that occurs in one child in a million, fortunately, and what these children need are really liver transplants. Would I use statins in um, high-risk individuals? And, th and these are the statin guidelines I'm giving you, brought out by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. They say in a high-risk individual to use a statin, I would say it this way. Again, if you have a male with a low HDL, and the reason why a low HDL is bad is HDL thins the blood. HDL is a potent blood thinner, and it's good for the immune system. So in a high-risk male, smoking male, type A, aggressive male, other risk factors, higher blood sugar, et cetera, yeah, I might use a statin for primary prevention, but I would use lifestyle considerations first. And let, and let me end this little soliloquy with this. The Framingham study, which has been going on for like five decades now, they found out that the people with the highest cholesterols lived the longest. Now think about that. And then there was a study in Italy showing that people with the highest cholesterols lived the longest. So there's something about cholesterol that you need. We need it for our brain, we need it for our heart. It's not the enemy. Now, is cholesterol found at the scene of the crime? Crime? Yes, it is. It has a small, it has a small you know, portion there. If you have, uh, Tom had it on his slide, oxidized LDL. If your LDL gets oxidized, if you're a cigarette smoker, you use a lot of trans fats, if you're around a lot, a lot of electromagnetics, a lot of mercury, if you're cooking with aluminum, you know, if you're under emotional stress, those things can oxidize LDL, and that can be a pro-inflammatory situation. So cholesterol is found at the scene of the crime, but it's not the perpetrator. So when it comes to statins, 
Middle-aged men with coronary disease, I don't like in the men over 75 because of the memory problems. You need LDL cholesterol to form the circuits in your brain. You need it for cognition. So if you, any of you are taking a statin out there and you don't know where your keys are, you don't know where your glasses are, you forgot what you had for breakfast, I would advise you to talk to your doctor about you know, changing the medication. So basically, those were the guidelines, and I agree with these doctors in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, by the way, Michel de Lorgeridil, the French architect of the Mediterranean diet, who said that saturated fat is healthy, he actually said in, 2005, in, in 2010, there was an article that came out, and he said that the statin trials before 2005 uh, were misrepresented. Because since 2005, when the Vioxx affair came out, and you know about Vioxx, you're an orthopedic surgeon, yeah. these people were dying because the Vioxx was clotting the blood. So the FDA put these companies under a microscope, and these big statin studies after the Vioxx affair aren't showing the data that they showed before 2005. So anyway, if you are on a statin, talk to your doctor. If you're a male, take some CoQ10, because I would take a statin if I, if I had coronary disease. I always ask uh, two questions. Is it gonna make me live longer or live better? And the majority of statin patients will not live longer or live better. There's not much data on women or primary prevention. People come in, some of, some of my staff are uh, young men, they have no you know, history of uh, heart disease and they're on statins. And uh, I think if they were told that uh, you know, it's gonna increase your uh, erectile dysfunction, you're gonna be weaker, you're gonna lose your memory, they would say, oh my God, for a relative, an absolute change of less than 1%. And so they play with these numbers a little bit. So, um, it pays to be an educated consumer, and I think uh, Steve has looked at that data. And a lot of the original data, the Framingham studies, a lot of the original authors came out and said, this is the biggest scam in the history of medicine. So with that, we'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll revisit the awesome foursome. Folks, welcome back. I'm here with Steve Sinatra, the number one integrative cardiologist in the country who combines complementary and traditional medicine. He's written the book, The Great Cholesterol Scam. We've been talking about pros and cons of statins today. And he wrote a, a previous book, uh, uh, many editions, uh, translated into many article or yeah, many languages, including the uh, Japanese, and um, which really discovered CoQ10, if I'm not uh, mistaken, Steve. Yeah, actually, um uh, CoQ10 was discovered in this country by Dr. Fred Crane. Uh, he was working with PhD researchers at the University of Wisconsin, and they were slicing up beef heart, you know, and, and they were slicing up the beef heart, and this orange substance rose to the surface of the test tubes, and they thought it was a carotenoid, you know, uh, but it was really, uh, the chemical name was it was, a, it was a quinone. And Fred Crane gave this substance to Dr. Carl Folkers, who worked for Merck Pharmaceuticals, and the discovery of CoQ10 occurred in 1972, and it was given its name in 1973. But then Merck Pharmaceuticals did the biggest blunder of the century. They sold the patents to the Japanese. So you are right, Japan, Japan from then on was making all the CoQ10 for the world. And uh, it's one of the biggest blunders by Merck. But Merck had the patent on CoQ10 and Lovastatin, which is Mevacor in the same pill, uh, and they had the patents for 20 years, but they never really exercised it because Merck knew how valuable CoQ10 was. And yeah. isn't it true in Canada that it's a, they have a black box label where you yeah. can't buy uh, a statin without um, being warned that it will decrease your CoQ10, but that's, that doesn't happen in this country. No, it doesn't happen. Yeah, on the, on, I mean, Canadian pharmacists, they'll tell you that if you are taking a statin drug that you need ubiquinone, uh, and, it's, and it's on the label. But, but basically, um, we, we need coenzyme Q10, and uh, that's the reason why I stopped using statins, because I was introduced to coenzyme Q10 when I was 31 years old. Um, I, uh, I just finished my boards in cardiology. I, I took five years of intensive medical training uh, with cardiology. And I saw a young woman uh, who had just had her second baby, and um, she developed what we call postpartum cardiomyopathy. I never seen a case, but it was on my cardiovascular boards, and I studied about it, and I was sharp on it. 
But postpartum cardiomyopathy means that she delivers a baby and the baby drains all the vitamins and minerals from the body. And uh, fortunately, it's very rare. But when you get it, you can get heart failure. And she went from doctor to doctor to doctor, emergency room, and she got placed on a heart transplant list. And then she came to see me and uh, I put her on coenzyme Q10, 10 milligrams three times a day. And she couldn't walk from here to maybe uh, that gentleman with the orange shirt over there. And uh, he's waving his hands. <laughs> and basically, she was so short of breath, plus she had a two-year-old at home. After two weeks of just 30 milligrams of Q10, she says, doctor, I can walk better. I said, really? Let's double a dose. And then she comes back a week later, and she says, I'm sleeping better at night. I'm not coughing. Great, let's double a dose again. <laughs> then she comes back, and she says, I feel good. I can go grocery shopping. I can, I can you know, change my two-year-old child. He's stressing me out, but I can deal with it. I said, good. Three months later, the Medical College of Virginia called her up and said, we have a heart for you. <laughs> she came to see me, and she says, should I get the heart transplant? And I said to her, I says, well, it's your choice. If, if you're feeling good, I would just stay in this program. She refused a heart transplant. <laughs> she's 65 years old now. And no, no, she's older than me. She's 69 years old now. And uh, uh, she's doing really well. So that was my first really, you know, messenger on CoQ10. And I've been using CoQ10, you know, ever since 1984, 82, 83, 84. So, <laughs> It's been in, it's my number one nutrient for healing the heart. Yeah, and, and again, with the other three nutrients in your previous book, magnesium, L-carnitine, and D-ribose, they all help the AT, ATP or the energy in the cell. And I think, I think one of the messages is that we're talking about CoQ10 and statins, how it depletes it. But correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but as you age, your natural CoQ10 goes down. So you don't have to be on a statin to take CoQ10. I take it every day. Athletes should take it because it does go down decade by decade. Is there, is there a form of co CoQ10 that's better than another? Where can you get it? Yeah, but first of all, you can get CoQ10 in any health food store. I mean, uh, there's two types of CoQ10. There's ubiquinone and ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is made by the Japanese. Uh, ubiquinone can be made by other countries as well. Um, uh, I've been using, I've used both, but I found that if you have a high quality ubiquinone, uh, a, a CoQ10 that's water soluble and fat soluble at the same time. Um, uh, the ones I give my newsletter subscribers, for example, um, uh, the ones I've been using for years, uh, it works. I mean, I, you know, if you want to use the more expensive ubiquinol, that's fine. I mean, that's fine. Uh, but until um, uh, somebody can show me that one Q10 works better than the other, a high quality ubiquinone is fine. And, and again, a lot less expensive. So I think the take home message is become an educated consumer. I think Dr. Sinatra's book can give you a lot more information. I think his website can give you a lot more information. We have mutual friends. I got another email today talk about the, the uh, quantum energy of the world from uh, Dwayne Gravelin. Oh, Dwayne, yeah. Dwayne Gravelin. The space doc. <laughs> space doc, he's a great guy. He's a NASA you know, flight doc. He had transient amnesia. He wrote the book Lipitor, The Memory Thief, The Side Effect Crisis, The Dark Side of Statins. You can look all this stuff up. There's a great um, uh, movie editorial coming out called The Statin Nation by Justin Smith over in Europe. He had part one and part two. It talks about the Statin Nation and uh, the pharmaceuticals <clears throat> barrage of statins on the country. There's so much information out there. We've just you know, touch the top of the iceberg here with Dr. Sinatra. He's thought a lot about it. He's generated a lot of controversy. It's all backed by references and research. So thanks for being here. Be educated consumer. Look it up online. I hope you enjoyed the show and join us next time.